Um, I am in the process of inventing an entirely new system of communication that cannot be hacked, that cannot be stolen, that's not reliant upon credit cards, upon details, upon computers, upon um, internet lines, etc. And I call it uh, paper and pen. <laughs> I know it's quite revolutionary for some of you. Um, I just had a thought the other day. Wouldn't it be interesting if, we, if what happens, so many accounts get hacked, we just go back to getting cash at our local bank. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, also a huge thanks to uh, Pastors Sam and Jess for inviting Valerie and I here. Um, it's our pleasure to be here, and uh, we hear a lot about your church, and we get to see you, and it's better than what we've heard. It's fantastic. We also got to meet last night, which was a real treat for me personally. We got to meet Kelvin Forbes. Now, I don't know if they're here this morning. They were here the first service. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. And uh, what you need to know, and this is going to change your life, is, <laughs> is that Kelvin's wife, Christina, like nobody else calls her Christina except me. Um, she always thinks she's in trouble, which she normally was. She used to work for me for a number of years. Or as I like to say, I think I worked for her. <laughs> so wonderful to meet you and great to see Christina again. Our delight. Well, good morning. And uh, I hope what I say this morning um, helps you. Uh, if it annoys you, that will eventually help you. <laughs> if it infuriates you, you're in need. <laughs> and if it has no, um, it doesn't even begin to touch your sphere, you're dead. which means you couldn't listen anyway, so that would be interesting. Um, so right now we're, you're in a series on money and, you know, how to use it, how to be generous, which is the demand of every believer. And we've, I, no doubt you've been talking about tithing. Um, I think tithing is the irreducible baseline of giving. Uh, for people who argue against it, most of them don't even tithe which is always interesting. Some argue against tithing uh, for various reasons, but they give more than a tithe. I respect their opinion. But not those who just try to get out of the, the, the beginning phases of generosity. Um, I think it was um, Martin Luther, um, the reformer from the 17th, 15th, 16th century anyway, long time ago. He said that a man um, needs two baptisms one of himself into water and the other of what he called his pocketbook. <laughs> so even back there, they realised that the grip upon people's lives of money is extraordinary. It's so normal we've got used to it and it drives a huge amount of what happens in the world today. Yeah. Hugely. Um, Paul said to Timothy something that's often misquoted. He said, the love of money is the root of all evil. So the want for another man's something, the want for more of something is the root of all kinds of evil because it creates all sorts of wars and hells in this earth and it continues to do so. So rather than look at the 10% though, I'm going to look about what do we do with the 90? 10 simple to me, axiomatic to our faith and our growth in faith is 10%. But what about the 90 because here's a thought, you may have heard this, maybe because of the 80s and 90s, I heard this a lot more than you did, but there was a sense around that if you tithed, you would attract God's um, blessing. Well, I don't think that tithing is a blessing attractor. I think tithing is a matter of obedience to God. So whether, whether it attracts anything or not is immaterial. But we live in this transactional Christian world where everything I do has to have some sort of kickback from God. My friends, he doesn't operate like that. God is not a slot machine. And our obedience to his commands is more important than you accruing from his promises. That was that's quotable, that. It's quotable. I might actually say that myself again some stage, if I remember. So Jesus said these remarkable words. I'm going to read them to you. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. Or in other words, 
If you can't get it right at this end, it's going to go awry at that end. If you then have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, interesting Jesus called it the unrighteous wealth. Jesus didn't always have a benign attitude towards money. Um, he called it mammon, which was not a term of endearment. But nevertheless, he realized something about it, and I'll explain as I go. He said, and if you have been, not been faithful, no, sorry, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? The context is money. The context is giving. The context is ownership. And what Jesus is saying is this. If you can't get the use of money correct on this earth, then you will not receive the, um, the, the promise of true riches, whether here or in the resurrection. That's a powerful statement. Because that means the way that you treat money predetermines the inheritance of true riches. So it's, you can't disconnect. You cannot disconnect physical actions from spiritual outcomes. And when we do that, we end up with a weird kind of dualism or a Gnosticism in which there's kind of the earthly who cares about it and the heavenly let's care only about it. But they are profoundly linked in fact, you know this because Christianity, as far as I'm aware, is the only religious system, or I would call truth, in which the resurrection of the body matters. God loves our bodies, and they have a, an eternal, magnificent inheritance and future. So money, you can't take money and treat it cheaply or allow it to treat you cheaply and think you are going to be the recipient of true riches. They may sound like tough words, but forget about whether they're tough words, they just work out. Now, money could be neutral, it could be morally neutral, but here's the problem, we are not morally neutral. The love of money, it's not money itself, it's the love of it. I remember years ago hearing a, a, um, a radio announcer, I don't know what you call them, Radio jock, will that do? Sort of pronouncing, he was quite anti-Christian. He said, well, that, you know, that Bible, it says that money is the root of all evil. Ho, 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 I thought, you idiot. <laughs> it's the love of money. If you're going to quote the Bible, at least get it right. Now, he wasn't there to listen to me, but I felt good in, within myself. <laughs> so, and then Jesus also warns us. He says, you can't serve money and God. How fantastic, oh no, how fascinating. He's juxtaposed God, whom we serve, and money that we equally serve. He didn't say, he didn't say God and love. He didn't say God and some, some other laudable attribute. He said God and money. He says you can't serve God with a whole heart and at the same time serve money with a whole heart. And also you can't serve God with half your heart and money with half your heart. It's one or the other. This is not a message about the evil of wealth. If you lis listen through with me, you'll see that wealth is not the problem. The problem is the human that screws it up. I'd like to say something that you might find um, disappointing but it's good that most Christians are not rich. Why? Because it would wreck you. It would wreck you. One of the most, uh, I think, morally reprehensible things that I've seen happen in the US in the last year won't be what anybody else thinks. It won't be, you know, mass gun and suicides and murders. One of the, well, that's bad enough. But one of the worst is that people in the lottery Twice or three times has happened this year in the States. $1.5 billion lottery winnings. That is the same as cursing a person. I would just about think we should legislate against it because it wrecks people. So if we, this is, but here's our goal. Let's start with the little and learn to be able to handle the much. Let's start with um, being faithful with this so that God can make us responsible for that. 
It's a journey, it's a life history. I am not there, I'm 69 years old and I'm not there. I'm still on the journey. I'm still realizing that I've seen the long-term faithfulness of God with my finances, but I, it hasn't always been simple or easy or particularly prosperous. I hope this is not you know, annoying you, or maybe it should. Serving money is not something that many people would admit to. It's, but it's more common for all of us, uh, and much more uh, if we're willing, it's more common, sorry, uh, for all of us than we are usually willing to concede. I'll give you some examples. Here's some maxims, however, before we kick off into some of the practicals. First one is this. Generosity is the beginning of our financial well-being, but not the whole story. It matters what you do with the 90%. You will, you will not prosper by just giving 10% and then being an idiot with 90. You have to, you have to, this is the things that we need to learn. Hard work and thrift and generosity and saving and restraint. None of those things are advertised on our televisions. None of them. Buy now, pay later. To which I might add, oh yes, you will. <laughs> Exorbitant interest rates that only makes shareholders and banks wealthy and impoverish you. So if you're in the banking industry, you know this is true. Please don't fight me. <laughs> Tithing is not enough alone. Giving is not a, enough alone to have a, a life of financial well-being. I'm going to say that financial well It doesn't mean you're rich, but it means you've always got something to give and you live in a state of... of um, Believing contentment. The, the, the gospel is not a means to get wealth. And Paul actually slammed people that used preaching as a way of making big money. And I think there are a few these days that are definitely guilty of that. Why people give them their money, I'll never know. Number two big one, your heart follows your money, not the other way around. People think, oh, my money will follow my heart. Uh-uh. These are the words of Jesus. Where your money goes, there goes your heart. It's true. That's true right across the board. Wherever your money goes, your heart follows. I would have liked it to be the opposite. Well, this is where my heart is. Therefore, my money flows along. Ah, but you've got a very weak view of your humanity if you think that. It's wherever our money is, our heart follows. Got to be careful. You can pull muscles when you're my age doing that. That's why I no longer do ballet. John Wesley, who's the um, founder of Methodism, is probably more of a hero in England and, and uh, Europe than he is in the States. He said these words that are completely contradictory, but they actually express a magnificent truth. He said, make as much as you can, give as much as you can, and save as much as you can. That's really wise. Work hard and make money. Give as much as you're able. And save as much as you can. So there's kind of like three pillars in his philosophy of giving. And uh, he was a very wise boy. When he died, he left very little. Very little. He left a couple of silver spoons in his library, apparently. Because he got, by the end of his life, he'd given everything away. And, um, you know, you, you could, there was some little, I'm going to be a bit cynical, he had a wealthy wife, so maybe that was a bit easier. <laughs> but he had a bad marriage, so perhaps that made it worse. That's why he did so much evangelism, to escape home. <laughs> so, let's... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I lo All of our heroes have flaws in them. Except for Sam and Jess. <laughs> Firstly, we are made to work. There's a creational mandate that insists that we work and work hard. I don't think there's any, any prizes handed out to um, workaholics except for the result of their disease. But I don't think there's any pri prizes hand out, handed out to the indolent who sit there expecting everybody to look after them, or expecting their government to look after them, or expecting their, you know, their rich grandmother to look after them. That creates, it's not just a false expectation, it actually does deep personal damage. 
Um, it's, this is, the mandate's as old as Adam and as fresh as this day. Work harnesses our energies, work directs our minds, work renews our bodies and brings benefit to our lives and that of others. People who don't activate their lives by work end up in destructive pursuits, meaninglessness, sickness and often early deaths. You'll notice that wherever there's a very high rate of unemployment, there's a very high rate of crime. And um, I'm not make, this is, I know there are some complications in what I've just made very simple, but the overall principle still works. High unemployment, high crime. And the people who create, who, who do the crime will argue that they have to live somehow. So that's, a, that's another whole story, but you get the point still stands. Um, wherever there's an old saying that we may mock, but it's as true as the day it was stated, is that the devil finds work for idle hands. Um, doing nothing cr creates a vacuum in the human soul. It creates dissatisfaction. It creates the, the desire for the illicit. Because there's nothing that's licit that's actually fulfilling them as a, as a human being. I hope that makes sense to you. And, and also my last thought here on, on this is that giving isn't a shortcut to prosperity or blessing. Um, you have to do, you've got to deal with the 90%. So let's talk about the 90%. I'm going to look at things, I'm going to spend more time on these two topics, debt and living within your means, because they both go together. And then I want to give you some stories of what the exercise of this kind of life has actually um, ended up or resulted in, in Valerie and, and my life. So you, it's got some context. First of all, uh, Proverbs something, says something like this or similar to it, debt makes you a slave of the institute or the persons you owe to. I can never figure out why credit cards are called credit cards. I think it's an advertising sleight of hand. They should be called debit cards. And I can't figure out why debit cards are called debit cards. They should be called credit cards <laughs> because you're in credit. Now, you know, for transparency's sake, I have very few credit cards. I've got one of the smallest wallets in the USA. I don't, it's not like I, I don't carry any cash, but I, we have a, I have a, a debit card, which means I can only spend what I've got. So therefore I have to be budgeting and thinking wisely about what I've got. We do have credit cards. We both have Platinum, Platinum Pro cards, which give us certain benefits when you travel, but we use them for business. They're paid off by the end of the month, and we have, Valerie and I have zero debt for anything. Now, I'm not expecting you right there in this moment in your life, if you have just bought, had a mortgage, to have zero debt. Don't think this is a, a cheap shot. I'm 69. I should be out of debt. I remember once when I had 70,000 to go on my mortgage and I contacted my bank manager or my bank customs, customs service relationship manager, <laughs> which is just another slightly disinterested person. <laughs> and, and I said, um, I want to transfer 70 to pay my mortgage off because I wanted the deed for my own house because the bank owns the deed until it's paid off or the legal document of proof of ownership. So a couple of months went by and I checked my accounts and I thought, that's interesting. That 70,000 hasn't moved and I don't have my, um, my documents of proof of ownership. So I rang the manager and I said, um, I wonder if you could help me. I, the best way to deal with people is don't go in with an accusatory tone. Go in questioning. So that's, that's just general advice. Go in questioning rather than some hot-headed accusation you'll often find you're wrong. I have learnt. <laughs> so I said, what's the 70,000 still doing there? And this person said, uh, well, we kind of just left it there as a, a line of credit for you in case you want to go on a holiday or buy a new car. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> I specifically asked to pay that mortgage out. Well, we, we just thought, I said, do you understand that my goal in life is to owe the bank nothing. That's my goal, to owe you nothing. Now, I didn't, you know, this, this is just a, a worker for the bank. I didn't berate, I think it was a her, I didn't berate her, 
because it's not her policy. And she said, got it, absolutely, so we'll get that uh, enacted straight away. And I said, thank you. I didn't blow up at them, but I, I let them know that my goal is to owe the banks nothing. And, that sh and, and you're, if you're in business, I understand you need to take out lines of credit. So I, I'm talking fairly idealistically, but I think still practically. And maybe I'm talking more about the domestic you, not the business you. Even then, be careful. Credit cards are a calculated risk by a bank. They always know they'll get more on return, even with defaulting taken into account. How do I know? Because the moment you pop above that 30 days, you go into the 27, 28% interest rate, which I think are as close to criminal as you can get. It's extortion, it's criminal, and I'm not running for office. <laughs> I'm not going to change the banking system. But we can, we can bypass the banking system in some ways. This is, but I want you to listen to me carefully. This is not a, a kind of a Christian perspective that everybody holds. This is just a wiser old man, older than all of you, so I've got to be able to know something. <laughs> Even if it's not how many hairs are on an elephant's trunk, I have no idea. It's not my line of expertise. Um, listen to the credit card debt in, in the US, generation by generation. Gen Z, $16,000 credit card debt. Millennials, come on, you've always done better than anybody else. 49,000 Ks. Hey, Gen X, the real winners in this game. 61,000 K average debt. Boomers, my generation, 52,000 K. Not laudable, but a whole lot better than X. Here's a thought, the money's not yours, it's the banks. In the early 1980s, I accrued a little bit of debt. It wasn't much, um, it, was in the, it was in the early thousands. It wasn't a lot, but I didn't have a big wage. We lived within our means, and it was just a little bit foolish of me to get that. And I, I know it doesn't sound much to you, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 maximum. What's that? It, so I said, Lord, please help me pay this off expecting like a check in the mail <laughs> or a bit of a return on my giving investment. Do you know what I discovered? The best thing for me. It took me three years to pay that off and in those three years I learned something. I learned that you, it's going to cost you if you go into too much debt. And the only way out is by regular, disciplined giving and saying no to the things you wanted. I would never have learned that lesson unless I had to do it myself. Now, unfortunately today, shopping is like a sport. But it's not a sport. And it's not an antidote to your domestic depressions. In fact, it'll only increase your depressions. Here's a thought. Wouldn't it be good if we became producers and not consumers? How cool is that? Producers, not consumers. Now, you and I know this, that mortgages are... Uh, these are running thoughts together. It's a little bit of a stream of consciousness. Um, mortgages are a calculated risk, yes. They are. Um, because I would always prefer owning my own house, even if I'm paying it off to the bank. I, I just hate paying rent because you never know when you're going to be asked to leave. I've, we've had good experiences with our landlords over the years. We've had some fabulous landlords. Why? Because we're good tenants. And so I don't, you know, and I've owned houses that I've rented. So that's not the problem. But you just take a risk. It's a calculated risk. You, you're, when you buy a house, your risk is that, the, the risk you're taking is that the market will keep going up. And it just seems to. People say, oh, we're waiting for the big collapse. Well, there's a photo in a real estate office of a man with long white hair and a huge white beard. And the caption under it is, the man who was waiting for, the int for um, housing prices to drop. He's a very old man. He looks like Rip Van Winkle. Now, there's a ghost from the past, for those of you who know. So I don't have a problem with having, you know, a mortgage. But I've known friends who've got caught on the downside and they, they have lost everything. These are dear friends. I'm not smarter. I won out on it. It's a calculated risk. And of course, banks are 
borrowing a lot slower. So let's, let's have a look at the tough stuff. Live within your means. This is my message. Live within your means. And this may sound harsh, but I think it's, if you just give time for it to settle in your thinking, you'll think it's at least reasonable. Right now, you're worth what you're getting. That's it. Right now, you're worth what you're earning. Oh, I, I take offense to that. I'm worth intrinsically so much more. <laughs> yes, I don't know what you're talking about. No, right now, I'm worth what I get. I might be worth more, but it's what I'm getting. I might be worth less, but it's what I'm getting. And so if I can live where I am, I'll have a better future. And by the way, so will my children. And here's the real kicker for me. I've got nine grandchildren. My grandchildren live off the benefit of us living a disciplined life. And that is beautiful. Not all glory to grandparents, but how wonderful for grandchildren. We never see our grandchildren without the spirit of lavishing. Now, we don't see them a lot because we live in Miami and they all live on, in Australia. But where we do see them, uh, we spoil them rotten, the little blighters. <laughs> so living with your means is about personal discipline. It's as much learning to not have things as, as it is to have things. If you can't afford it, don't. Every Christmas for years, um, friends around us who had more money, their kids had a way, way kind of like, more presented up Christmas than my children or our children. But um, it, it makes no difference. I would not go into credit card debt and be paying off in September my Christmas debt from the year before, and that's very common. Live, oh, but the children will be disappointed. Help your children to be disappointed. Help them to realise that life is not just the gifts you get. There's a lot more to it. And if you can't afford it, don't do it. I, I have certain things I'd like. I'm not going to tell you what they are because I don't, I don't want anybody thinking that God spoke to them and told them to give it to me. <laughs> I have things I'd like, but I don't have them. Why? I can't afford them. I always found this. Be careful how you buy. Be careful how you buy. This is how I buy. Completely annoying to salespeople. I'll go, if, I, if I don't look at it online, which I tend to do mostly these days, but if you go to the shop, I look at the product, I look at our, my needs, I look at the money, and when the salesman's absolutely sure that they've got the right sale, I say, awesome, thank you, and go home. Don't buy it. You know what I go home to do? Let, let that emotional thing drift out. Guess what, next day, I don't need that. How ridiculous. I don't need a roof on my house. We're good. No. <laughs> I don't need that. How am I? And how many times have you brought something new and faced the terrible disappointment that didn't change your life? You get a new car. Now, some of you can't get a new car. I can. I got a new, uh, or I have been able to. I've got to tell you, though, my favourite part of my life was not owning a car. In London, we, had, we did not need a car. Just there's so many forms of transport. I loved it. No, no petrol, no in insurance. I loved not owning a car. You cannot live in Miami and not own a car. Everything is a very long walk. <laughs> so we bought a car. But you get in the car and you're driving. You go, oh, this is awesome. The next day, it's got a little dent on it. Or oh, it's, it's getting dirty. Look, it's like, whatever I thought it would do for me, it never does. That's why Paul could write this, which utterly fascinates me. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be bought low. He's talking about money here and provision. And I know how to abound. He said, in any and every circumstance, listen to this, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. That's a mature soul. He wasn't shifted by having little he wasn't shifted by having much. He didn't become arrogant with having much. He didn't become depressed with having little. And then he said this fabulous statement that's always taken out of context. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul's specific context is not that you can go and beat up another football team. <laughs> it's this. The specific context is that Christ strengthened him so there's the same there 
and he was the same there. That's a mature person. If you're not shifted by your circumstance and it doesn't change your basic direction, motivation, love for Christ, and all that goes with it. So, simply create budgets and live within them. When I first got married, I had a little book. I know this sounds awful. And I'd write how much, the first power bill that came in, I'd figure out, well, that's going to cost me from now on about that per week. So every time in my wage, I'd literally write down $3.20. My wage was $90 a week. It's a long time ago. <laughs> um, and then I'd write um, food, I'd write it down. I remember at one stage paying about $15 a week for groceries. Isn't that staggering? You can't even get plastic bags for that. <laughs> um, and then, every, and so then I'd save it. So when the bill came, I always had the money. I never used impulsive buying and then said, whoops, um, I can't pay the power bill this month. I'll have to put it on a credit card. Now, I know there are times in life where this is a tad idealistic and sometimes pressures force you to use means you'd rather not use. Those things are understandable, but they should not be your modus operandi. They should be the things you occasionally have to face. Valerie and I, in London, we set, and we could, we could have given much more than this, every Christmas, 100 pounds each to each other. Not the cash, but it made us creative. So I'd go out and I'd buy a book I knew she wanted that I'd really enjoy reading afterwards. <laughs> Just saying, men are naturally self-serving, give us some room. She would buy this or that, and we always, I loved Christmas Day. Because it was like, it was an inventive moment. You know, what can I give Valerie that costs around 100 pounds? And it was never one thing, it was about three or four things. Loved it. We didn't need to spend any more. We could have when we, if we wanted, and occasionally we may have. But you understand that. Just, so look, I, I was, I've got only a minute, two minutes left. I was going to talk about gambling, but um, I just don't have, this, I don't have the time to talk about it. Except to say this, the big issue with gambling is that it, it's a short circuit to the normal process of doing well. It's dangerous. And I love these signs they put, um, that gambling companies put up, gamble responsibly. That's like saying speed carefully. Or do heroin but only on weekends. I mean, you might, you might as well say the same, it's ridiculous. But look, what I want to talk about is that because of this, um, you know, measured and at times quite frugal lifestyle. Some of those, and a background to that is some of those, some of you have heard of the Protestant work ethic, which is taking a hammering under critical theory. But the Protestant work ethic worked like this, essentially, is that you work hard and you save and you give. It was typical of Europe around the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries and it became a way of living. It created frugal living, it, it created self-sustained living, and where possible, it, it created generous living, which I think is all gospel from start to finish. And so, because we've worked hard at this and, and saved, we've been able to do things that we couldn't have otherwise. Remember that we're older. Remember that we've had some, some good wins in real estate. Just remember, take those in the background. But in the last year, we've been able to give 100,000, um, no, in 2021, I think, we gave 100,000 on top of tithing to two situations. One was family, to make sure that an elderly family member felt cared for. And the other was a very dear friend of mine, a beautiful friend who had an absolute shocker in the real estate market, not because of greed, just because the market collapsed. 10 years later, he still owed over 50,000. And that was, and so I rang him one day and I said, Valerie and I want to pay your debt out. I always thought it was about 30. And I said, what is it? He said, 53. I said, <laughs> I actually, I thought it was 35, but I sort of got it partly right from the Lord. It was just back, back to front. It was 53. So I, I feel there was a prophetic note in there. We see in part and we see sometimes upside down. So I rang him and I said, we're able to do this. Um, and he just cried. He just wept. And he does not cry. And you know, I'm not saying that as any self-aggrandizement. 
I'm saying it because that's what you're able to do. But it might take a long time. Uh, I think last year also we gave a number of $10,000 gifts to pastors. Um, pastors are right in front of my vision all day long. It's largely all I see as pastors. And so we're able to do that to help some of them have a holiday, to help some of them help their children or whatever it was. We didn't put parameters on or caveats on what they use the money for. Now look, that is, some of you may live with way bigger numbers than that. But that to us in our world, that's fairly generous. And we'll continue doing it. Why? Because we work hard, we save well, and we're generous when we can. We're little tiny disciples of John Wesley. And my encouragement to you today is basically this. Beware the insidious power of money. That's what Jesus said often. Number two, use personal restraint in how you live and what you buy so that at the end of the day, you've got something to that you can be blessed yourself with and you can also bless others. And I anticipate with Vera and I that that won't stop. That will increase over the years. And maybe, maybe I could have bought a whole lot of things for that. But who cares? Does it matter that much? The more you accrue, the more fear you will end up with. What extremely wealthy person has no fence around their property? They all have gates, security guards, and, and razor wire. Why? Fear. So the more you accrue, the more you set yourself up for fear. I know that sounds a bit harsh, but it's true. So thank you for listening to me. I mean, it, you could have watched the sports and it might be a happier day for you. But I think this will help you. And by the way, the people in the top rows, I'm sorry I didn't reference you, but you're not exempt from this. <laughs> Feel the same pressure. So let me pray for you, Lord. Thank you for this, uh, this wonderful church. Thank you for all these amazing young people who are, who are beginning their journey with Jesus, finding their way forward. And I pray that they would find their way into, into, into financial responsibility and generosity in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, yeah, let's give uh, Pastor Simon a hand. Thanks, Pastor Simon. Can we, can we just go back to that posture? If you could just bow your head and close your eyes again. Um, we just want to invite you to respond to Jesus. This lifestyle, this behavior, um, it's, it's a part of it. It's, it's aligned to a Christian lifestyle, a Christian behavior, but it stems and it's rooted, it's motivated by this belief that Jesus died and rose again for you that you don't have to earn this basis of righteousness, that he already did it. And so you are once and for all justified. And so, you know, it's, it's unattainable to live that lifestyle without God and without actually receiving the gospel. And so if you're here today and you haven't responded to following Christ, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Come to me and you will never grow hungry again. And you're like, I need to respond to this message. I need to respond to follow Jesus and deny myself deny all the things that the world tries to offer me, deny its pleasures, deny its comforts, and say, God, I want you, because you are the only one that will satisfy my soul. If that's you today, I'm gonna, in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand to identify saying, I wanna follow Jesus, I wanna surrender my life. Um, but also, I wanna also give an invitation to those who maybe are coming back to Christ and you need to recommit your life to Jesus. You need to recommit and say, God, I wanna, I wanna make this decision today to follow you. Even though I made it once before, maybe I made it twice before, but I wanna follow you. There's something that needs to, my heart's not right and I need to make it right. And so if you're one of those two people right now, while no one's looking around, I just want you to put your hand up really high so I can identify it. Amazing, I see that hand, awesome, beautiful. Up on the balcony, I'm just scanning as well. Just put your hand up. I see that hand, brother. Awesome. Just put your hand really high so I can just see it. One second. Okay, there's about three hands. Is there anyone else? Amazing. Thank you, ladies. You can put your hands down. Beautiful. Hey, so why don't you pray this prayer after me? We're going to do this as a church, uh, but just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I surrender my life to you. I receive the gospel. I receive what you did, Jesus. The perfect sacrifice that has justified me once and for all. 
I repent of my sins. I acknowledge you as my Savior, and I follow you as Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God some praise.